so I don't normally pick titles this long. Uh, I was I was trying to think about. It's always tricky to pose a talk when you're not sure about the sort of level of expertise of the audience. And I was well aware that tonight, um, my level of expertise is probably below uh, quite a few of you. Certainly, Mike and Jan and Toby. Um, you've got you know fantastic knowledge. So it's I, I've. Yeah, just try to do a summary of what we do as Devon Wildlife Trust in terms of marine conservation, um, some of the amazing finds we've had at Wembury this season, um, and, and our, the main focus will be on, on shore search, which is how we've linked to the shores of South Devon. And I'm hoping that, you know, we've got the start of a really great relationship between our, our two organisations now, and as well as, as Coastwise North Devon as well. So it's great that Jan... And Muriel are here. Um, it's a really nice little link between all of us. So yeah, as as Mike said, we'll we'll catch up at the end. So I don't think I need to uh, to explain to you guys. I, I often show this picture at the start of most of my talks because um, this is what most people see, I suppose, when they look out to sea. I would I would argue against this now because I think there certainly in the summertime there'll be about fifty boats, a navy ship, a cruise liner. Uh, and 500 paddle boarders. So it's definitely not that quiet, certainly not down here in, on the south coast. Um, but, you know, the the average person, the average citizen of Devon, if they go to the beach, this will be the first thing that they see. Um, not many people know that over half of Devon's wildlife lives in its seas. Um, and it's important that we say seas in Devon. We're the only county that can get away with that because technically we do have two seas, two coastlines. Um, and I just think that's it's amazing that over half of our wildlife lives in the sea. I didn't know that before I joined DWT. I don't know who's counted it all. Um, and I would imagine that they've still not counted all of the wildlife in the seas because there's still so much to discover, as lots of us know. Um, I'm sure you'll recognise quite a lot of the photos I'm going to use this evening. Um, the really, really good ones are Paul Naylor's or Keith Hiscox. Some of the less good ones will be mine. Um, and we've got some other good ones from my team at Wembury of, of staff and volunteers. So I've, I've hopefully acknowledged people on the right slides. So um, what, do, what do I do as Devon Wildlife Trust in terms of marine conservation? I know um, historically we had a, an actual marine team, but I think... There's definitely a public perception that we don't do as much as Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and that's definitely true at the moment. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, we did have a, a dedicated marine conservation team, which for one reason or another um, dwindled, I suppose, over time. Projects went in different directions. The, you know, funding has always been an issue. Um, so part of my talk tonight is, is to show that we are doing... Um, as much as we can, I suppose. And I wanted to just highlight some of those things. So we'll talk about the visitor centre at Wembury, um, the education work that we do, public engagement. And then, as, as I said, the main focus is on our citizen science work. Um, but I also want to mention our marine advocacy work because that's quite a lot of the behind the scenes work that perhaps people don't, don't see so much of. So hopefully you've all been to Wembury before and to Wembury Marine Centre. If you haven't, then you've got about three weeks to come down and visit us before we close for the winter. Uh, the centre closes at the end of September, um, but the wonderful beach and rock pool stay open all year, which is fabulous. But the centre has been there since 1994. So um, quite a long time now, almost 30 years. And the Wildlife Trust have been in charge of looking after it of managing the Marine Centre on behalf of a partnership. So these other logos you can see on here are the other organisations. These are the main funding partners, the top five. And then we also have the support of the Wembury Marine Conservation Advisory Group, who were the group that set up Wembury as a marine conservation area, a voluntary marine conservation area back in 1981. So I think Wembury and Helford were the first VMCAs in the, in the Southwest back in 1981. And then I think um, Dorset Wildlife Trust at Kimmeridge um, designated there soon after. And then since then, a whole load of, of voluntary marine conservation areas have set up. There's amazing marine groups all over Cornwall. And now we're seeing the same in Devon, which is really, really fantastic. So it's great that lots of good stuff is happening in terms of our marine environment. So at Wembury, we couldn't do what we do without our amazing volunteers. So volunteers will feature throughout 
um, the talk this evening. I think all of you are volunteers for for at least one of one of your organisations, probably in in various things. I find when once you're a volunteer for one thing, you often get talked into volunteering for other things. So um, I don't think there's anything more rewarding than being a volunteer, and we're incredibly grateful for the volunteers that we have at Wembury uh, and at Devon Wildlife Trust. So um, part of the work that I do uh, through Wembury, but across Devon, um, includes marine education, what we call ocean literacy, which is raising awareness of how the ocean impacts us as humans and how we can impact the ocean. So we have lots of school children that come out to Wembury every year, about two and a half thousand children from around 50 schools, lots of inner city Plymouth schools, but schools from around Devon, um, even some from Cornwall, some from Exeter. Um, so they, they come out for a guided rock pool safari, maybe a beach clean. We go into schools and give talks. And we also run more in-depth projects. Um, we've run projects like Marine Wildlife Champions, which works with small numbers of children for a year where we go in and talk to them about the challenges facing our ocean and our marine wildlife. And then they have to come up with projects to try and do something about it. So it's a really important child-led project where we want to empower children to be the change that they want to see rather than telling them that we need to do this and that, try to put the power in their hands. Um, and some of the stuff that they've come up with over the years is, is absolutely incredible. So we definitely love um, working with school children, both in the classroom and on the beach at Wembury. So we do that year round. Uh, most of the schools want to come in the, the summer term between sort of May and July. So it can be very hectic down at Wembury on a, on a summer's day. Um, but with the weather that we're having these days, I think you can't guarantee sunshine no matter what month it is. So we're really trying to uh, to make it a year round offer of getting children out onto the beach. Um, public engagement is a massive part of what we do. Devon Wildlife Trust has been running Rockpool Safaris at Wembury for 30 odd years. Um, again, I'm sure m many of you might have been to one before or known someone who's volunteered here. Um, it's a big part of what we do. So from the start of the Easter holidays, through the half terms, through the summer holidays, we do lots of public engagement events. Um, Rockpool Safaris has always been our bread and butter, but in more recent years, we've expanded to do snorkel safaris, which is one of my favourite um, activities to run. It's a really nice way of, of allowing people to experience the underwater world, see it in a completely new light, without disturbing it in any way. Um, I think we have to acknowledge when we do rock pooling, we are having an impact. Um, and what I love about snorkeling is if done correctly, we can just observe marine life, you know, how it should be. And the, the way that the seaweed comes alive under the water is just incredible. And we, and we get great feedback from people as well. Um, we also go to lots of uh, external events like the Yelpton show. We've been to Devon County show this year. Um, so we get out and about as much as we can. We're a very small team. Uh, I'm the only permanent full-time member of staff based at Wembury. We have two seasonal assistants. And then, as I mentioned, we have our amazing volunteers who we really do rely on to, to deliver all these things that we do. Um, we've had a very successful pirate weekend this weekend, uh, this bank holiday weekend just gone, which was a three-day event that uh, my colleague ran. Really, really great event. Um, families love anything to do with pirates so um, that was fab picture on the bottom left is of a coastal walk we did for our local U3A group this morning which was just fab I learned, learned lots about coastal plants so our assistant Jake is very knowledgeable about everything basically so um, I had a chance to learn a bit of terrestrial stuff which was really nice so yeah lots of lots of public engagement throughout the the summer months um, and, and during the six month season that the centre's open so, uh, as I said, I was trying to think of, you know, what, what to talk about, because I know you, you're you going to know lots of species. So I didn't want to just start talking about um, what, you know, what we might consider our bog standard species, even though they are, they're all fascinating and I could talk about them all day. Um, so I've just picked really a top 10 from this summer, from this season, that uh, we found perhaps quite a few of, or that we just, just really like and um, the top knot is the first one of those. So um, again, hopefully we'll have a bit of time for a chat at the end to see, because I'd be really interested to see the sorts of things that you've seen this summer, whether it's 
similar to us down on the south coast at Wembury or whether you're finding completely different things. Um, but the top knot of fantastic flatfish. So I think it's it's usually what we'd call the only flatfish that we find in in rock pools, which is quite nice. So we don't have to, to struggle to identify it. It does look quite different to the other flatfish. Um, but again, absolutely fascinating. People don't think about flatfish as being found in, in rocky pools and rocky reefs. And um, we think of flatfish as being found on the sand. We've found lots of these at Wembury this season and fa fairly big. So this um, this picture here, the tubs that we use for our rock pooling are the, the sort of standard ice cream tub size. So we found a real range of sizes, um, but just a gorgeous, gorgeous fish to find in the rock pools. So that's uh, that's number one of our, our species. Um, the sea hare. So I know it's technically not a, a true sea slug, but it's actually a snail with an internal shell. Um, when you start going back it through sort of uh, the genetic diversity of species, it just can get totally mind boggling when we're talking about whales that are actually dolphins and dolphins that are whales and all those sorts of things, let alone when you get down to the small little critters that we get in our rock pools. Um, but we have found quite a few of these this year and lots of eggs. I couldn't find any photos of their eggs, but these these swirly purple, almost like someone's squirted jelly on the rocks, um, are their, their egg masses that they lay. And they're just incredible little animals. Um, the one here you can see is a sort of brownie colour, so that will be because it's eating brown algae. Um, so they their coloration reflects their diet. So we'll get the, the pinky reddy ones that like to eat the red algae and then perhaps some more green ones that eat sea lettuce and things like that. But this one is just perfectly blended in with this um, sargassum seaweed behind it and just incredible little creatures. So quite a few of those we found this year, but not a huge amount of other um, nudibra nudibranchs or sea slugs. We found a few others, but this is definitely probably the most common one, I think. Uh, brittle stars, lots of brittle stars. We've had some uh, incredible tides over the last few weeks, again, as I'm sure you know, and we've had um, what we call extreme rock pool safari. So when the tide is sort of 0 0.6 or below, uh, we'll, we'll put on an extreme rock pool safari, so usually about one a month. And that's where we go further out onto to Blackstone Reef at Wembury. Um, we go out for a bit longer um, and we find, you know, a real array of, of species. And the tides that we've had, even just over the last 10 days, we've had some 0.2s, which are just incredible um, for the end of August, early September. Um, so brittle stars have featured heavily on those extreme rock pool safaris and quite difficult to identify. I think a lot of the time when we find them, I assume they're common brittle stars. And when I upload to iNaturalist, they usually come up as common brittle stars, but um, occasionally we do find the other species as well, but um, I'm definitely not an expert in brittle stars, but just absolutely gorgeous. And the public, anything anything starry shaped, the public absolutely love to see them. So that's really nice. Um, snake locks anemone under a UV torch. This was taken by one of our volunteers on uh, one of our nighttime rock pool safari. So again, a really brilliant public engagement event. I would encourage you guys, if you haven't already, as the shores of South Devon and as coastwise to to run a, a nighttime rock pool safari, even if it's just for your your members to start with, um, the health and safety isn't isn't really that much. You know, the risk assessment in compared to a daytime rock pool safari, um, obviously you have to think about the the lack of light depending on where you are. So at Wembury, it's completely pitch black at night. There's no there's no lights anywhere. I imagine it's probably similar up on the north coast, perhaps around Torquay, you might get a bit of light. Um, but just, yeah, a fascinating event to do. Members of the public, you know, it's even us, it's just mind blowing. I mean, I've never seen a snake locks anemone with this this pink, beautiful, or almost like a flower inside the green tentacles. Um, so yeah, abs absolutely fabulous. Um, I was getting asked about nighttime snorkel safaris, which we definitely don't have the, the go ahead from our health and safety uh head yet but um that that's a future a future ambition perhaps we'll see that would be fab so jan i'm so glad you're here because i've got a stalk jelly in in my top 10 so um jan Brilliant. i've always known as the stalk jelly expert 
And I found one of these by myself this season and I was very chuffed. I did have to send the image. You can see, by the way, what I meant about my photos versus Paul Naylor's. You can tell which ones are mine. Um, I had to send this one to Matt Slater at Cornwall Wildlife Trust to, to ID it to species level for me because we just don't don't find them enough. I know that they're there. Wembury used to be absolutely full of them. Um, MBA scientists used to come down and collect them in their, their 10s and 20s. But because most of the time we're, sh we're looking for crabs and starfish for children, we don't always have the time to look for these really small things that would interest us, which is, um, I'll, I'll come on to that, which is a real benefit of shore search, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But yeah, Maltese cross stalk jelly, we found in the last few weeks on some Irish moss seaweed, which is just fabulous. So I was really, really happy to find that one. Now, a couple of really exciting species that our volunteers actually found. So on one of the days, um, our snorkel safari was an absolute washout because we had a weather warning. And so we decided to just do a bit of um, volunteer training, sort of snorkel training in a large rock pool, um, which wasn't getting battered by waves. And one of our, our volunteer team found this amazing candy striped flatworm. I've never found one before uh, myself. So it's really, really beautiful to see it. And what I, what I always say to people about marine life, you know, not that it's a competition, but compared to perhaps terrestrial things. So certainly with the sea slugs, you know, how much how much more beautiful and colourful are they in the sea compared to the land? I don't want to do a disservice to the slugs on the land because everything's beautiful in its own way. But, you know, come on, the, the, the sea slugs we get in the sea are just incredible. And I think the same goes for the worms as well. I mean, some of the worms... You know, they they do look pretty vicious and scary that we get in the sea, but then you get these beautiful candy striped flatworms and the green leaf worm and, you know, lots of others. These double spiral fan worms we found. So this was in the same big pool. We found fan worms. Again, haven't, hadn't found these rock pooling before, only snorkeling, um, because we get them right down on the lower shore. But this big clump of them, absolutely stunning. So, yeah, really lovely finds this this summer in particular. And we found a few lobsters rock pooling. Again, that's not, not very common. Previously, we'd only found a couple. And this, I did wonder if this picture had been enhanced. This was taken by one of our volunteers, but looking at the, uh, the sawtoothed rack behind it and the other seaweeds, I don't think it has been enhanced because those colors look like they should. And so this is a really blue, beautiful common lobster, European lobster that they always turn up on the days I'm not working which um, is really annoying because they are one of my favourite um, marine animals. I absolutely love the lobsters. Um, so some really great finds. And we've actually found, and we've had reports of quite a few young ones this year, so smaller lobsters. This one was sort of medium-sized, I think. Um, but we found a few small ones rock pool, uh, snorkeling um, and had a few reports of young ones. So it's, it seems like it's been a good year for lobsters, fingers crossed, um, although at Wembury, the, you know, the pots are definitely out there to catch them, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and the find of the season was last Sunday. So a few days ago, of course, it was my day off as well. Um, our assistant, Jake, who was leading our Rockpool Safari, came across this. Um, so Jake's identified it as a cat shark. I wasn't there to see it. I... I'm still not sure if it's a cat shark or a nurse hound. To me, it looks a bit more like a nurse hound, but I don't see sharks enough. Um, and you never see them side by side, the two species. So I think we still need to get a bit more advice on that. So if anyone anyone here is good on your sharks, I'd, be, um, I'd love to have a chat about that at the end. But if not, I'll ping it over to the Shark Trust just to double check. Um, but that was in a, a rock pool. Again, on a, it was a really good tide on Sunday quite a far out rock pool, just chilling there in, in the rock pool. It actually came and rested its head on a girl's foot. And so she probably had the experience of a lifetime of not knowing what to do, um, but she stayed calm and, you know, just absolutely incredible. So hopefully we've dispelled some some myths about sharks being horrible, scary, um, human eating animals. So again, a really fab year for, for those sorts of sightings. And, Apparently, the most exciting sighting of the of the year of the century was this uh, Portuguese man of war, which uh, one of our volunteers found while she was out kayaking. 
Um, this was actually my wife, Sam, who uh, managed to get an hour out on the kayak and got this gorgeous picture of a Portuguese man of war and really flat, calm morning. Um, and we shared it on our Wembury Marine Centre social media. We said, you know, what a fantastic sighting, you know, really good image, good picture. Um, they're not uncommon, but it was quite early to find one, I suppose. And the, sa the same day, we'd had three smaller ones wash up on the beach. So we put it on our social media and just said, you know, incredible animal, learn more about it, just be careful not to touch it. And so, of course, it went absolutely viral. It was on all the national newspapers. Um, it turns out it made it as far as the Miami Herald and the Kansas City Star. Uh, both Sam and I were on BBC Radio Devon talking about it at different times. So, Mike, this was what this was what it was about uh, on Radio Devon. This is what started off the conversations. So it's a it's a really interesting one. And we always say that sharks and jellyfish seem to always make the news. Um, a couple of years ago, Sam had an incredible kayaking experience with over 50 common dolphins just leaping past her kayak, just past a mew stone. And that that happened to be at the same time the, the Men's World Cup England were playing. So interesting, again, Mike, you said something about football earlier. Um, and it didn't, the, the, the video, incredible video, didn't really go very far. And that, and that was, from our point of view, a way more rare and fascinating encounter but it, it shows the things that the media pick up on and it's always the sort of scaremongering story. So we were really um, keen to to get on the radio and dispel, you know, debunk the, the stories that we all need to be running for our lives because there's Portuguese men of war in the water. Um, you know, we always get them. They tend to come in a bit later in autumn, but because of the summer storms, they've obviously started to come in a, a little bit earlier this year. But Again, another another re, a way for us to raise awareness. So it's often these these things that the media pick up on, but then that gives us an opportunity to talk more widely about marine conservation. And so another part of of our work at DWT is around citizen science. So we try to do as much as we can in terms of citizen science. Certainly, more recently, um, we always take part in the Great Egg Case Hunt, which is a, a really engaging project to to get children involved with to get families involved with anyone and everyone really because mermaids purses are just fascinating and the resources that the shark trust produce are really really good so the identification leaflets um are really really easy to follow and again i'll, I'll talk pick this up a bit later with the shore search but with some marine citizen science projects it can be really difficult actually trying to identify what you're finding if you're an absolute beginner whereas with the egg case hunt you can find an egg case, you can look on the guide, and it's pretty easy to identify which species it came from. So it's a really great project that we you know, encourage anyone to get involved with. And the Shark Trust app is, is just fab, and you can do it all on the app now. Um, so we run one of those every Easter. We do our Easter egg hunt with a difference. Um, we do the Great British Beach Clean. So the Marine Conservation Society have a couple of beach cleans a year. We're doing one uh, in a couple of weeks' time um September 24th I think and they'll be going on all around the country which is fab and then the sort of three projects I, I'm going to talk about um after this are our, our sea watches which was something new something I've been desperate to to start to pick up again actually because we did used to do them um and to get going again around the county um starting at Wembury um and and that's that's our sea watches for for marine megafauna. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I'll pick up on some of our marine strandings work as well. Um, but as mentioned, shore search is the main the main marine citizen science project I wanted to talk about. It's what connects um, connects all of us here. And again, it's something that I've really got into and really sort of enjoying coordinating and and so pleased that shores of South Devon and Coastwise and hopefully more groups are going to take part in because it's a really fab, a fab project. So I know uh, most of you are aware of Shore Search, but just in case anyone's anyone's new to Shore Search. Um, so it's it was actually launched 20 years ago, um, but it was at the same time as the Marine Biological Association's Shore Thing survey. So back then, I think there were citizen science projects coming out of our ears 
um, and people didn't know which one to do and variations upon a theme I think there was lots of reinventing the wheel um, but at the end of the day whatever citizen science project you're doing I think is valuable and as long as the data is going somewhere important then that's all that matters um, but we read that the wildlife trust so our national body of which all wildlife trusts are a part of is the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts so they act on behalf of um, all wildlife trusts when it comes to high level policy in terms of marine conservation, when it comes to national citizen science projects. So they relaunched Shore Search. They had some funding to develop resources um, and, and felt it was really important that we get proper records of what's going on in our intertidal marine environment and getting that data into a central portal. So um, that was launched a few years ago. COVID sort of um, got in the way of things a bit. So really, it's only it's only really kicked off in the last couple of years. And there are four different survey methods to shore search. And each method gives a different type of data. And so hopefully for any level of volunteer and or the public, there's something that, that they can do and that they can get hold of and they, they can understand. So there's varying levels. So why why do we want to do shore search? Why do we want to encourage you guys to do shore search and other groups? Um, firstly, it's a great way to raise awareness of local marine biodiversity. Um, it's really public friendly. It can collect really important data for marine conservation and for marine protected area designation. So Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who definitely been leading the way in shore search, were able to use some of their shore search data to get marine conservation zones designated in Cornwall. So it's it's really fantastic that a citizen science project can produce such high level data that it's really taken seriously by the statutory organisations. And Matt's working with Natural England and the Environment Agency on some really brilliant stuff. So. I hope that, you know, one day we'll get to that point. Um, in Devon, you know, we're a little bit behind that. And what I really want to do is to just get people interested in it, to to get volunteers upskilled and taking ownership of their, their local patch and keeping an eye on it, basically. Um, so it helps monitor long term changes. This is the thing that we're we're focusing on in Devon, I think. Um, and that's things like invasive species, climate change indicator species, indications of pollution um so it helps us keep an eye on what's going on basically hopefully um it's good value for volunteers so we've talked about a lot about what the data is doing where it's going i know this is a really important thing for coastwise in particular um you know if we're giving our time for free we want to it to be worth something um and for that information to go somewhere so it's really important that the data um, is going somewhere important and in terms of us as, as wildlife trust it helps us achieve our charitable objectives in terms of that raising awareness in terms of getting in data um, and and going from there so the, I mentioned the four different survey methods we've got walkover surveys time species search a box core survey and a quadrat survey. So the little star by the box core survey, that's something that would take place in either a sort of sandy beach or a muddy estuary. So Somerset Wildlife Trust have given, given those a few goes. At Wembury, we just do the, really we do walkovers and time species searches. We've done the odd quadrat survey, but at the moment, like I said, I'm just keen on the sort of fun side of things, raising awareness and just getting people's um, expertise up to a sort of standard level, um, whereas the quadrat survey, so the walkover survey is what I call rock pooling um, whilst recording what you're finding. So it's a rock pool ramble in a certain area um, and you record everything that you find basically. So it introduces people to the diversity. So it's getting a broad scale. It's like putting a broad brush over the rocky shore and seeing what we come up with. It gives us qualitative data on species distribution and it's good for introducing beginners to the rocky shore and to marine life. And it doesn't really require much equipment. So when we go out, um, we I've got the, the work phone, which has got the shore search up on it. It's got a camera on it. I think Joe's here who brings his camera and gets some really good pictures. That's pretty much all you need for the walkover survey. Um, and then we just have to mark out a rough square. 
So it can be 50 by 50 meters. We usually use the C as one of the corners. Um, and at Wembry, we are spoilt for choice in terms of where we go because it's such a big wave cut platform. Um, we could do a survey on, on the middle shore or we could go further out onto the lower shore. And we've done both this year. And I'm keen to do, keep doing that by trying different areas, but also to repeat the same areas so that we can see what we're finding year after year. Um, so walkover survey is definitely um, the most surveys that we've done at Wembury this year, it's the walkovers. The other part that we like to do is a time species search. So we normally tag this onto the end of a walkover survey. Um, and we've also done some time species searches with the public this summer. So we've called them extreme rock pool safaris with a shore search survey. Really interestingly though, they have not had half as many um, bookings as just the extreme rock pool safari. So I think I need to think about how we advertise them because even though people are technically getting more for their money, I think the, the term survey maybe puts them off a bit. So it's quite interesting psychology um, and thinking about how you market things and how you label things. Um, but when we've done the, the time species search, it's actually been really good. We had a load of kids hunting for things last week. Um, some of them successful, some of them not so much, but actually it worked really well. So the time species search is just a presence or absence survey for a limited time. And it's looking for climate indicators, non-native invasive species, and then native species that might be changing their distribution. So these could be um, what we would, native species we would consider as colder water species that might be disappearing because the waters are getting warmer, or they might be disappearing because of overfishing or pollution, things like that. So it's a 10 minute search for up to four species. We don't do give people more than three species. It's usually two or three. So it's either a 20 minute or a 30 minute search and it's really important to highlight that absence is as important as presence because if we're giving someone a Chinese mitten crab species card we're hoping that they're not going to find it so it's really important again so that that's quite an easy easy way to engage people really easy to fill in the the recording form um and and quite rewarding really in that you know it's just simple we've we've given some good data um and it doesn't take too long. So it's a nice, nice little thing to do. So the Biodiversity Quadrat Survey, um, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Somerset focus quite a lot on this. They're, they're really keen on, um, you know, getting really down and dirty with what's there on the shore. So you have these quadrats in various random locations down the shore. Um, and you identify everything that's found within that quadrat. So it's a bit more time consuming. You need a bit of a higher level of, of knowledge and expertise, or at least someone in each group who knows what they're, they're looking at and identifying. Um, but you do get that more robust data at the end of it. So, you know, really reliable data that could be potentially used by someone like Natural England or the Environment Agency. Um, so, again, the, the reason for developing these different survey methods is hopefully... Um, it means that there's something for every everyone. I'm sure some of you just would love to rock pull. Some of you like to to really look at, at everything that you're finding. So the quadrat survey might benefit. Um, so it's just a, about trying out these different survey methods, seeing what the groups like, um, and then just just rolling with it. So box core survey. We haven't done one of these as I mentioned. So it's like a soft sediment survey. So either on mud or sand. Um, you need good either some good ID guides or good knowledge of what we call infaunal species. So these are species living within the mud or sand, things like uh, lugworms, crustaceans, mollusks. And you so you get this core from the sediment and then you identify what you're finding in it. So it's a, I'd like to give it a go somewhere one day. I think North Devon Coast has probably got quite a few sites that, that we could do a box score survey on. It'd be good to um, good to practice. And so I just wanted to sort of highlight a, a, some things that we've noticed this year through doing shore search, mostly linking to the time species search, but also just some of the general observations that um, we found whilst doing the walkover surveys. And again, I'd be really interested to hear um, how your surveys have gone around the coast and whether you're finding the same sorts of things or not. So invasive species definitely on the rise. 
Um, Pacific oysters. So I know they're they've they've been around for a while. Wembury is situated right next to the Yelm estuary, and the Yelm is absolutely riddled with Pacific oysters. Um, the Yelm was inv was involved in a project with uh, South Devon AOMB, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and Natural England, where volunteer groups were out on the shore actually um, monitoring them and actually trying to get rid of them. Uh, and they they did hundreds of hours on the Yelm, and it's it's basically not made a dent in in the number of oysters that are there. But for some reason at Wembury, we haven't had the same situation. So I know Pacific oysters tend to do better in, in the estuary environment anyway. But so Wembury was quite clear. And then you get to Mount Batten, which is between um, the Yelm and Plymouth. And Mount Batten's got loads of them. Plymouth starting to get loads in all of the, the, the man-made surfaces and the marinas and things. Um, but as I said, Wembury it doesn't have many, but what I have started noticing this year is quite a few small juvenile Pacific oysters. And, and I think it's sh through doing shore search, it's made me get my eye in a bit more to actually notice them. Um, and it is, it is a bit of a worry because once they're there and they're actually cemented onto the bedrock, even if, even if they were removed or, you know, bashed, for want of a better word, which is what they do, what they did in that in that culling project with a hammer, um, the the bottom shell is still there, cemented into the the rock. So technically, nothing can really grow on that because it's mother of pearl. So that's a bit of a worry that that I think we're finding more of these at Wembley, and we need to to think about what we're going to do about that. Um, and again, interested to hear if if you've thought they've they've increased harpoon weed. We've always had it at Wembley for as long as I've been there. But it seems to have really bloomed again this summer. Big, big patches of it when we're snorkeling. So by big patches, I'm talking sort of metres long, two to three metres long and maybe a couple of metres wide. Um, so that's that's certainly on the increase. And I'm just selecting a few because these are the ones that happen to be on the, the shore search, time species search cards. But really, I think all of our invasives have have been increasing and again slipper limpets at Wembury we only ever found empty ones um we've been finding live ones now so this um this image is not great because it shows a collection of slipper limpets looking like a croissant which isn't very helpful when you're trying to help people identify them there should be an image of a single one so that we can see what one individual looks like but we're we've we haven't found any like that all on top of each other in a mating chain, we we're finding some individual ones, only a, only a handful. But again, you're thinking if we're not if we're not specifically searching for these, are we missing them? And by by far the the biggest change that we're noticing is the Montague's crab is it's completely taken over at Wembury and I know it's it's happening the same in Cornwall and and Dorset are starting to notice it as well. But I think. Again, we don't have the the evidence to back this up because we don't do crab specific crab counts. But from our anecdotal noticing, um, I think it's probably the most common species now at Wembury. So it's it's more common than the shore crab. I might be wrong, but every single time species search we've done, we found it. They are, you know, every one in um, three crabs that we'll find on a rock pool safari will be a Montague's crab. So very very common. And that's a climate change indicator. So when we're talking about climate change indicators, we mean species that have tend to prefer warmer waters. So these would be Mediterranean species that are now going to become more common in the UK. Um, it, that we've we've potentially always had them, or we've had them for a while. So they're not the same as invasive species, but they're they're going to become more common as our waters get warmer. And another one of those is the St Piran's hermit crab. So these have gone absolutely mad at Wembury. And um, Mike and I were just chatting at the start about a PhD researcher who's doing some research into these in relation to climate change and in relation to the common hermit crab. And they are certainly at Wembury and um, at the other sites that she's studying, the, the St. Perrin's hermit crab has completely taken over. So 10 years ago, um, I think it was about 10 years ago when they reappeared in Cornwall. So um, this was another one that did actually make the news, which was really good. Um, but they were they 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 were used to be here. They disappeared in the eighties. 
various theories as to, to what sort of happened, but um, the scientists stopped finding them. And then about 10 years ago, the first one was found again um, in Cornwall and it went to a public vote and it got the name St. Piran's Hermit Crab. It's also known as the Mediterranean Hermit Crab. So if we want to be patriotic here in Devon, we can call it the Mediterranean. Um, but they've gone they've gone absolutely mad. So they they seem to bloom in these these little um localized areas. So in a, if if we find a couple in a big rock pool a few years ago, now you find about 20 or 30 in the same pool. They've they've just absolutely gone mad. And um it's quite concerning that they will outcompete the the common hermit crab. Um, but as you can see, they're they're striking creatures um and certainly something that we've noticed and and sure such is obviously helping us to back up what we're thinking so we're getting those records in snake locks and anemones again we've always had these um but we they're just everywhere now so we're finding them you know the green variety the the pinky brownie variety um really really common and again it, i'd be interested to hear if you're if you're finding an increase in those as well and then two species which aren't on the time species search list uh, is codium. So codium has a native um, or green sea fingers. They've got lots of common names. Uh, green sea fingers, velvet horn, I think as well. There was a native species and a non-native species. And the only way you could tell the difference is, is I think by using a microscope or if you're extremely skilled. Um, but I think we're far, I'm noticing a lot more of it now, and I'm assuming that it's the invasive species. Um, and so I'm just just chucking in a couple that aren't on the the shore search list. So the invasive species codium we're finding a lots of, and the climate change indicator, the cushion star. Again, um, you can't turn over a rock at Wembury usually without finding one of these, which which is lovely for public engagement. But I think a real signal that now that you know, climate change really is here. The, the waters really are warming. We've had a marine heat wave for the first time this year, the hottest water temperatures on record. Um, lots of reports of other warmer water species like triggerfish. Um, Paul Naylor was mentioning about variable blennies, which are more of a, a Mediterranean species. So I think when it comes to these conversations about climate change and invasive species, sure search is helping us to um you know back up a bit of of what we're what we want to say it's giving us that sort of evidence that we need to you know it's not all to do with climate change there's lots of other factors which affect what's found where um but we can we can assume that it's certainly having some sort of impact so just to to finish on another couple of citizen science projects that we are reinvigorating um one of which is our our Sea Watch, what we're calling Sea Watch Saturdays. So um, unashamedly have ripped off the Sequest Sundays, which Cornwall Wildlife Trust run. So Sequest was another citizen science project that um, Cornwall, Devon, and I think Dorset Wildlife Trust set up uh, about 15 years ago. It was called Sequest Southwest. And all three wildlife trusts would do regular sea watches for marine megafauna. So these are things like cetaceans, seals, seabirds, uh, turtles and basking sharks um, and again with various staff changes project changes fund, funding changes it it fizzled out in Devon um, and so I've been really keen to try and get sea watches going again people are absolutely fascinated by um, whales and dolphins an incredible engagement tool um, but sea watching is actually really difficult. So we do take part in the Sea Watch Foundation's National Whale and Dolphin Watch every year. We've always done that. But um, I'm really keen to get regular monthly surveys going. Um, again, like Shore Search, we're, we're going to start at Wembury, but I'm really keen to get it spread around the county on both coastlines um, and get some, some really important data in. So we've got a fabulous Sea Watch expert called Paul Burley, who's done lots of stuff with Orca. Um, and marine life and he knows Abby at Cornwall Wildlife Trust and he, he lives locally in Plymouth and he's just been amazing and he's he's, he's helping us to start to train and, and upskill hopefully some local people who like with Shore Search I want to get a local group sort of set up to do sea watching um, but it is actually a really difficult skill to master uh, 
first of all, you need a really decent pair of binoculars or ideally a telescope. And actually, even me just looking down the telescope on on Saturday, I was getting a banging headache because you're sort of you can only look through one eye and um, the the things that you need to be looking out for. Uh, it's it's certainly a skill to to manage, but again, you know, we're getting fabulous sightings this year. There've been bluefin tuna, common dolphins have just been everywhere around the southwest. Um, so you know, another way of really trying to keep an eye on what's going on out at sea. Because it's one thing trying to keep an eye on what's going on in our on our coastline and on our rocky shore. We can access that fairly easily, but trying to protect mobile species when we've got you know a, t a sort of 12 mile stretch out to sea um is really really difficult so any sort of information and data we can gather um is really really important so sea watches we're starting monthly surveys and like i said hopefully we're going to build that up around the county and sort of linked to that um, is this fpod project which some of you might have heard heard about the cap project uh, which is through Chelonia. They've um, created these incredible acoustic monitors for cetaceans under the water. So it's basically like a big underwater microphone and they've donated uh, an F-pod to local marine groups. So Cornwall have got lots, lots of these F-pods deployed. Uh, we were approached to see if we wanted one and we definitely said yes. Um, so there's a photo of Keith here. Uh, after it was collected from HMS Coronation, which is where it, it first went. Turns out the University of Plymouth were also donated one and theirs was on the same wreck. So we've had to remove ours and we're still trying to get it a bit closer to Wembury, ideally within the marine conservation area. Um, but it's it's proving tricky because it's it needs to be attached to something um, solid and sturdy. So there's there's various things that we need to work out for that. But what we're hoping is when we get this data and it can detect um, it can detect porpoises and it can detect dolphins, it can't detect individual species of dolphins yet. Um, and it can also detect human activity. So it detects sonar. So what we're hoping to do is when we, when we learn how to analyze the data, when we get some data, compare that with the sea watches that we're doing to try and get more of a picture of, of what's going on. And certainly around here, around Plymouth, there's lots of, boat activity there's naval activity is that affecting what the marine mammals are doing um you know so it's, it's all really exciting stuff basically and this is all citizen science stuff because there's there's no funding behind it um so really trying to just mobilize people and their interest and enthusiasm to um to make these things happen basically and you know we're so grateful to people like keith and paul naylor and the the marine conservation area advisory group who you do a lot of this stuff in their own time so fingers crossed and then something which is very uh important to me close to my heart is the marine strandings network again this is another southwest project and um, that has been going for quite a long time i think it's been going for over 20 years cornwall wildlife trust have got an amazing army of volunteers around the coastline who are trained to go and record dead marine strandings. So sadly, when uh, dolphins, porpoises, sharks, seabirds uh, wash up on the beach, volunteers get called out and they go and record them. They take photos, they take measurements, they get as much information as they can from that individual. If it's a if it's freshly washed up, hopefully it can be taken for a post mortem, which is the only way you can really ascertain what's caused the death of an animal but but as bycatch so accidental capture in fishing gear is one of the biggest killers of common dolphins and harbour porpoises here in the southwest and you can see signs of bycatch um, through these observations so it's really vital information that we can get um for a really unfortunate situation basically so in devon we've had a handful and i mean literally a handful of volunteers um until recently dave jenkins was the only person on the north coast of devon who was part of this volunteer network um, and so i've been really trying to invigorate it to get some more volunteers going and to just kick off 
the Devon Marine Strandings Network again. So Abby and Cornwall have been fantastic in basically giving us their resources, giving us lots of support. And um, I applied for a small amount of funding from Sea Changers to get this leaflet developed. So this is hot, hot off the press. We've got a new leaflet with all the contact details for Devon. What to do also if you do find a live marine animal that might be in distress, and that's to call a separate organisation, which is British Divers Marine Life Rescue. Um, but we've got two training days coming up in October for um, both South Coast residents and North Coast residents. So you need to live in Devon and you need to be willing to travel to your local beach uh, or beaches to, to monitor and record these, um, these marine strandings. So all the data that we we create through the this network goes to the cetacean strandings investigation program who are based at the zoological society in london and then they do the real sort of hardcore science they do the post-mortems and that is what feeds into the conservation of these species so really really important thing um for us to be doing and something I'm really, really keen to develop. So if anyone's interested in marine strandings, we've got training sessions um, or you can get in touch with me for more information. And then um, just to finish up, I mentioned our advocacy work. The Wildlife Trust really have been the leader in campaigning for marine conservation zones. So I know that the process is all finished with now, but for 30 odd years, the Wildlife Trust campaigned really, really hard to get marine conservation zones designated. And Devon was one of the most successful at doing that, at engaging the public to get behind marine conservation zones and really try to get some designated. We ended up with 15 in Devon on both coastlines, which was a pretty good number. Um, we know now that these, these marine conservation zones aren't really fit for purpose. They're not doing what they should be doing in, in protecting that whole area. They only protect individual species or habitats if they, if they do that. Um, they're not being properly monitored and they're not being properly policed. So we now know that the only way to really protect an area is to designate it as a highly protected marine area, um, which would make it similar to um, Lundy, uh, where it, it really would be an, a no-take zone um, and a low impact zone. So uh, last year, I think the year before, the last couple of years, we put lots of information forward to the wildlife trusts to with with some areas in Devon that we thought um, would really benefit from becoming a HPMA. Cornwall Wildlife Trust did the same, Somerset as well. Um, that all fed into a, a national response from TWT and the government. Um, and only three, I think, have been designated in other parts of, of England. None, none in the southwest at all which was a massive blow, um, but we keep fighting. So I just wanted to raise that because that, that was a really important thing that I'm really proud that the Wildlife Trust have been involved with. Um, and like I said, I know, we know it's not perfect, but it's that a lot that took so much behind the scenes work and partnership working. Um, so we also have a uh, presence on catchment partnerships. So Devon Wildlife Trust hosts um, the East Devon Catchment Partnerships and my colleague Ed Parferris is on that one. I attend the Yale Mestery Management Group and the Port of Plymouth Marine Liaison Committee. Um, so we do as much as we can with very little staff resource, basically. Um, we have a good dialogue with, with companies like Southwest Water. They're, they're a controversial organisation, but we work with them on projects um, to, to try and improve things in the, in the marine environment. And I'm pleased to say that we We'll have a new permanent full-time marine member of staff at, at DWT starting in the next few weeks. So again, this has been a long time coming. Um, and I, I really hope that having a, even though it's it's only, you know, it's one more role, one more person, but um, it will really help us hopefully move forward with, with our marine conservation work in Devon. Okay, so just to finish up, how can you help? So we always follow the seashore code. I didn't talk too much about that. That's just basic rock pooling best practice. Always follow the seashore code when we go down to the shore. Um, supporting highly protected marine areas. I don't know what the next plan of action is. As I said, it was a big blow not to get any areas in the southwest um, designated, but only only a handful in the whole country were, were going to be designated as pilot sites. So these are pilot sites and we hope that they're, they're in future um, will be more sites designated. But 
we will be campaigning for better protection, whether it's in the form of HBMAs or, or a different acronym. Um, we'll certainly be doing that. So watch this space. Guardianship um, via voluntary codes of conduct. So again, the, the Marine Conservation Area at Wembury, um, Paul in particular, worked really hard on this code of conduct. It looks very wordy and that was pages and pages of information um, that have been dwindled down into 1A4, which is probably still too much. But this is something we're trying to get across to, to people. It, it was a stakeholder process, so everyone could have their say. We have a lot of spearfishing going on at Wembury. It's something we really try to discourage, but it's really hard. This is a voluntary code of conduct, um, but we really want to engage the, the local community to, you know, like like the logo says, enjoy, protect and inspire. Um, so, you know, encourage all of you via your your local areas to you know even if you don't have an official code of conduct to just spread those messages um taking part in citizen science hopefully i've flown the flag for citizen science it's great fun it's really valuable really worthwhile um so do do find out where your nearest shore search or sea watch survey is happening um and as you can see i use this slide in all my talks so join us at devon wildlife trust as a member or volunteer Coastwise, if you're around North Devon and, of course, the lovely shores of South Devon as well. Okay.